Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Quant University Summer School. My name is Sri Krishnamurthy, and I'm going to be the host, and I'm also going to be a presenter in today's session. Uh, today, we are fortunate to have uh, Stu Cazola from the MathWorks, and uh, Stu and I used to work together at the MathWorks many, many years ago. And at that point, uh, we were all thinking about how do we scale MATLAB, how do we kind of you know, build all these models and manage all these models and look at parallel and distributed computing, put these models on the cloud. We were looking at the world in a different way when we were kind of taking all these things and structuring use cases. And 10 years later, the industry has changed. The, the world has changed the way machine learning and artificial intelligence which were niche topics 10 years ago, have become the norm for every industry. And as we think about using these kinds of models in our day-to-day -day work, especially in the financial industry, wherein we have tons and tons of data, we have to think about new ways in which we can structure workflows and organize all our pipelines and models and data associated with it so that we can do what we do best, which is analyze data and see those nuggets of information which are out there so that we can take strategic decisions. So uh, in this particular segment, in the last uh, six weeks or so, we have been having various academics, uh, authors, we have had uh, industry professionals come down and talk about various aspects about machine learning and finance. In this session, we are gonna particularly focus on this whole aspect about how do you manage machine learning models in the financial industry? And we're gonna take uh, you know, two approaches. One is uh, Stu is gonna present you know, the MathWorks' view of the world and how they are looking at and interacting with various customers and what they are seeing in terms of the challenges which customers are gonna be, uh, are currently having and the solutions they're gonna be providing. And uh, what I'm going to do is show a use case wherein uh, we as a, a company, wherein we all also do algorithmic auditing for various components, illustrate a workflow on how you could incorporate various components and uh, build out a pipeline for auditing purposes for various machine learning models. So that's kind of the plan for today. So let's get going. Um, as uh, most of you know, uh, by now we uh, are from Quant University. Uh, we are a data science and uh, analytics advisory based out of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we started Quant University in 2013, uh, seven years ago. Uh, primarily at their, you know, fo to focus on the intersection of data science, machine learning, and finance. So we started out as a consultancy, and we've been working with large uh, banks, asset management companies, regulators, primarily in a B2B space. Uh, but in the last few years, we have expanded our offerings and have been putting together various programs in the training realm, and we are offering those both online and on-site. And we also have a bunch of certification programs, uh, which I'll briefly talk about in a little bit. Um, so uh, for people who are getting exposed to the summer school, uh, we have uh, started uh, the Quant University Summer School in 2020. And in the last seven weeks, we have had three primary courses, one uh, data science foundations course, primarily to get uh, to know the nuts and bolts of data science. And the second one is a machine learning and finance course. And the third one is a model risk management course. So we have uh, all these courses uh, happening concurrently and uh, we have students from 12 plus countries working with us and uh, learning various modules. And we appreciate the support of uh, Premier to uh, you know, put together, to help put together these courses and making it available primarily for their membership. Uh, so we are also launching the fall school and uh, please uh, take a note of it. Uh, we have uh, many more courses coming up in the fall. In addition to that, uh, we have our first FinTech bootcamp especially post COVID-19. So which are, which are the kinds of business models which are gonna be survivors, which are gonna be accelerating, which are gonna be diminishing. So all those aspects will be covered as a part of the FinTech uh, uh, program uh, bootcamp. So this was successfully done in Boston last year uh, at Babson College. And uh, we also offer, this as an elective at Northeastern University in the MBA program. And we're gonna be in, you know, bringing in guest speakers, uh, innovators, uh, investors and uh, taking a 360 degree view of uh, FinTech uh, later in the fall. Uh, so that's uh, briefly a couple of uh, you know, quick reminders and announcements and uh, let's get to today's talk. And uh, uh, we're gonna be primarily uh, having Stu do most of the presentation today. And I'm gonna be doing a short demo before we open up for Q&A. 
uh, for people who are uh, listening to us live online, uh, please uh, use the chat window to put your questions for both Stu and me. And if you are watching the live stream on YouTube, please post your questions on YouTube's chat window and we'll also be able to answer those questions for you. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Stu. Uh, Stu and I, as I mentioned, uh, have known each other for more than 10 years. Uh, Stu leads FinTech and the quantitative finance efforts at the MapWorks. Uh, so he has an FRM, he has an MBA, he also has a master's in engineering. And I think Stu, you are the third uh, affiliate or uh, you know, a, a person associated with Carnegie Mellon University. We had Reha Tutunku who kicked off our whole summer school series. Uh, he, had, he had actually taught at Carnegie Mellon. And then we had uh, uh, Dr. Julia Fanti from Carnegie Mellon. So she uh, made a presentation a few weeks ago. And then uh, I, I realized that uh, you have your uh, master's degree from um, Carnegie Mellon too. Yep. Yep, uh, so, my MBA. Uh, you got your MBA, perfect. Yeah, from there. So, uh, um, so it's a beautiful campus. I, uh, I was there at the summer school in 2014. So I was, uh, I, I love the whole ambience and uh, uh, kind of uh, the spread out nature when you're you know, in Boston, everything is like compact and then you can kind of you know, see how the world works when you're kind of more outside of Boston. Um, so uh, Stu has also been instrumental in leading many of the efforts, primarily in the context of integration of various products, but also scaling and making uh, various uh, analytic solutions uh, in, a, in a worldwide web mode and also uh, in the context of online uh, presence in the uh, for models and uh, uh, the management of various models. So he has been uh, instrumental in putting together various workflows and I'd love to hear from Stu on what the thought process is and how this could be scaled. And I also want to acknowledge the support of MathWorks for today's session uh, because they've uh, been uh, supporting us in various ways, uh, but in this particular session, they have sponsored this particular session. So I very, uh, very much appreciate that, Stu. Um, hey, you're welcome. So uh, all the demos and the slides of today's session will be available on Q.Academy. And uh, uh, recently we made an integration with um, the MATLAB online server. So we are the first company to offer the MATLAB online service available through the Q Academy. Um, so which means that you can, with the click of a button, you can launch MATLAB sessions and uh, we successfully trained uh, various folks for a regulator recently. Um, so uh, we have a solution out there, so which I'll give you a demo about. And then I'll also show how various components will integrate with the, the Q sandbox in my demo. Uh, so uh, Stu is going to talk about the strategy of the MATLAB online server, the production server, and various elements in his talk too. Uh, and you'll be able to access those slides and uh, parts of those demos as a part of the Q Academy. So without further ado, and oh, by the way, for people who are uh, interested in using the Q Sandbox uh, brief introductions, just use the code Q Summer School. That way you get access to the specific materials which are presented as a part of the summer school. Okay, um, next week there are going to be a, a session on, there's a session on AI explainability and bias. And uh, Jennifer Jordan, uh, who is a Techstars EIR, uh, but also an investor. And then Karim Saleh, who was uh, leading explainability efforts at Zest.ai. And a couple of other entrepreneurs are going to come down because uh, explainability is a hot space. And uh, we'd like to kind of get the lay of the land and also talk a little bit about interpretability, explainability in the context of AI models, specifically in finance. We're gonna have a fun discussion there. Okay, so those are all the present uh, announcements I had for you today. And I will share my, I will make you the host too. And uh, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, start present. Thank you. Okay, let me just go ahead and share my screen. Um... Okay, Shri, can you see that okay? Yes, thank you. I see it just... Uh... Okay, so um, thanks again, Shri, for having me. This is, um, you know, so machine learning and AI is a topic I've been involved with for multiple years. I was involved in the area. Um, basically, I was just known as statistics and optimization before it became data science and before it became the AI area. So today I know many of you guys have a variety of different backgrounds. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start out with kind of a little bit of context in the way I like to view the AI and machine learning space. And then the second half of the presentation, I'll kind of dive a little bit more into the financial services um, specific aspects of that. But anyway, so as Shri mentioned, my name is Stuart Cazola. I'm working for the MathWorks. Many of you probably recognize this more by their product name, MATLAB, or even Simulink. Um, Many people don't know that MathWorks is actually the company behind it, but that's the name of the company, our key platform pro 
product is MATLAB. So the outline of the talk that I'm going to talk about today is really I'm going to start talking about kind of the evolution of algorithms to machine learning to what's commonly referred to as the AI landscape today. Um, give some context into why that has happened, what's driven that change. And then the challenges related to AI or even model validation, particularly with uh, the kind of the digital transformation that's going on in the environment today, how that's really disrupting many things that you've done. And then COVID-19, I think, is just, you know, accelerating many ways. Um, how organizations are adopting automation, robotic process processes, and technology in general. And then later on, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about the way we view kind of the criteria for a trusted AI model. Um, the Mathrix has a unique perspective being that, you know, we service a variety of technologies. Our background is really engineering and science across all industries. And we have um, a different perspective on how we actually use AI algorithms for safety critical systems. And that kind of derives from the aerospace and automotive industry that we service. Uh, you think of automated driving cars, UAVs, we're, we're heavily involved in the command and control systems that are used in there. And the ability to integrate AI in terms of a certified safety critical system is something that we look a lot into. And that actually can actually be reflected and used across finance as well and some of the tools that you would use. And then I'll talk more specifically about some of the um, ability to integrate new or even challenger models into a model risk management lifecycle. We've recently developed a, a whole platform or solution for managing model risk throughout the financial services organization. And I'll kind of give you an introduction to that, but then also talk a little bit more about kind of how you can integrate and automate the, the documentation and validation of models. So with that, the first section I'm going to start into is really, you know, the, the concept of moving from machine learning to artificial intelligence. Um, many of the algorithms that are out there today, they're, they're not really new. They're kind of evolutions of what's been around for well over 50 years. If you think about it, the first, the first concept of a neural network was published in 1960, and it was a percepton uh, model. And that was really the, the kind of the, the, the leading thought framework that kind of kicked off the rise of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, along with the neural network model, started to come into a field of study, particularly mathematics and, and engineering. Um, throughout the years, though, there have been different changes to neural networks. So there was a percepton. Now there's many different kinds of shallow networks that were, were brought, you know, around the, around the mid-80s. And decision trees started to pop up then, too. And that actually is right around the time of the rise of the Internet, where we actually started to get a lot more data. Uh, many of the machine learning models are very data intensive. So in able to use them, you have to have lots of data and particularly labeled, labeled data. So even, even though we had these models before, they weren't really applicable until I started to build these libraries of data. And then over the years, you can see different kinds of machine learning models have come, come about, such as support vector machine, the logistic regression at a large scale. Um, if many of you are coming from finance, particularly credit risk, you might be using logistic regression in that area. And then just around about 2000, I think around 2008, 2009 is when deep neural networks were actually kind of first, um, the first publications came out on that topic. And, and there's, and since then there's just been a revolution kind of around that coupled with a variety of different things that I'll talk about. So when I think about kind of the, the, the landscape of different applications that have been used that have been going on from the beginning, um, a lot of it has been machine translation. So you can think of, um, you know, computers being able to speak, that's been around for a long time. That technology has been ar around and in use. If you think, I think of an old show, War Games, I think it was called, um, where he was typing in commands and having a computer talk to him in the movies. All the way to the more advanced things you're hearing today about sentiment analysis of the markets, algorithmic trading, um, and things like that. So the whole landscape is really falls under artificial intelligence. The field of study has been around for many, many years. I remember I, when I was at, I believe, um, getting my first master's at Rensselaer, I enrolled in an artificial intelligence course. Um, that was around the 90s. Um, and that's where they were talking about, really is more around a computer programming course and integrating a variety of things, not necessarily the machine learning algorithms today, but how to build computation systems that can respond to human input and behave kind of um, in a logical fashion. And then more recently, kind of the areas have been, you know, a subset of the artificial intelligence landscape is machine learning. Many of the algorithms will kind of go over in a little bit more detail, but this is where we're seeing a lot of that application today. Um, if you think of finance, some of the more popular machine learning algorithms, even today, still tend to be decision trees. Um, they're very easy to use and they tend to work quite well on financial data sets. Deep learning is being used in a variety of different ways, but it's not the dominant, I would say it's not the dominant algorithm. Um, more de de decision trees tend to be more dominant today. 
And then the deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So it's still part of machine learning, um, but it's the one that's getting the most attention today because of the, its ability to kind of have very high accuracy. And that's what's enabling things like automated driving, speech and language recognition, and many new trading and robotic applications. But then also there's been more and more interest in using a combination of machine learning, deep learning um, in, into what's called reinforcement learning. A little bit later, I'll kind of give an overview of that area. So, so why did the deep learning really kind of take off? Well, that really kind of happened because for years there's been kind of an image processing challenge that's been out there. It's been, you know, how many, can you teach a computer to recognize objects in an image and do that with higher accuracy than human has always been the challenge. And this just kind of lays that landscape for that. So in 2010, 2011, you can see accuracy was still pretty bad, couldn't beat a human. Um, that was using traditional machine learning techniques. Then they started applying deep learning techniques around 2012 and started building different architectures and, and um, deep learning networks and applying them on there. And then you can see around 2015 is when there was actually an architecture that was built that actually could beat human rec recognition accuracy. And that's the point where we kind of really took off and, and deep learning became a big thing because now suddenly we can build computer systems that could beat humans in many different tasks. And that's why the drive for that. On the right, you can also see that the rationale for this and the enabling technology has really been GPU computing. So about the same time that we we, we got high human accuracy compar comparatively, GPUs took off. They took off in the field of now applying the deep learning applications. You can see just the exponential growth since 2015. It's really 60 times higher than it was three years before and, and maybe even since 2015. So that's been kind of the driving force to get us there. So it's a combination of algorithmic improvements coupled with um, hardware optimization. Now, just to kind of give you a feel for the landscape of machine learning versus deep learning and kind of the different application areas, um, I'm gonna go through a few slides that kind of walk through some of the different algorithms here. So machine learning is really segmented in kind of a couple different areas. The, the two dominant ones are unsupervised learning and supervised learning. And then there's kind of a bucket for other things that's really dominated today by reinforcement learning, but there are also other things that use semi-supervised learning as well. I'll talk about that one specifically a little bit later, but I'll focus on the top two for the next few slides. And really, when you think about unsupervised learning, that's trying to learn characteristics of data. So what we're doing is looking at data, we're trying to group and interpret it, um, really kind of coming up with clustering algorithms is unsupervised learning. So there's not really an input-output relationship that you need to feed into the algorithm. It's just you feed it data and try and look at the different characteristics you can get from it and clusters. In finance, you might think of the different segments in the market. You might think of commodities versus like um, retail foods as another example. So the other one is supervised learning. And this is really the one where you're trying to develop that predictive model and where most of the effort in, in a variety of different, different other areas are today. And this one does require an input and output labeled data set to train the models on. And then you often apply it to um, a validation data set, which the model have never seen, and then to the real world data as it comes through. But this is generally broken up into two different areas, classification and regression. Now the difference between clustering is clustering kind of puts things in different buckets. Classification is actually trying to put them in buckets, but also label them. So this is really where a lot of the object detection comes in that you're seeing um, in a variety of different things. And then regression, many of you probably know from a variety of different forms. And this is one of the things I like to highlight as I go through some of the algorithms coming up is that many of you have probably technically been practicing machine learning for many years. You just didn't know um, some of the algorithms that you're using are part of the machine learning landscape. So the main thing about clustering is that it's usually trying to categorize the output. Same thing with classification, it's, it's a categorical type of output. But regression is numeric and this often can be a continuous variable as well. So it's no longer just kind of buckets, but actually it's a, it's a, it's a number. You might be trying to forecast where the stock market's going tomorrow or predict someone's credit score over a continuous um, spectrum. So if we look at um, the unsupervised learning, here are some of the most popular kind of algorithms that are used. K-means clustering, fuzzy C-means clustering, hierarchical algorithms. I put deep in parentheses because before that it's been mainly been neural networks for clustering, but now deep has actually kind of evolved and, and expanded that area of capability and accuracy. Gaussian mixture models and hidden Markov models are, are some of the most common ones. If you come from a statistical background, you probably recognize this about all these algorithms. Um, maybe you haven't played with neural networks as much, but all the other ones you've probably seen or heard of in some way, shape, or form. In the supervised area, there's classification. Um, under that area, this is the type of algorithms that you typically see from support vector machines, naive Bayes classifiers, nearest neighbors, again, deep neural networks, decision trees. 
and then linear and nonlinear regression. So, you know, you may not have thought about it, but often regression is used as a classifier in many cases. And so the techniques you might be using there definitely do apply. Now, the other one is the ensemble methods, which is kind of just below decision trees. And, and ensemble methods typically means like taking a weak learner, grouping many weak learners together and using the aggregate prediction to create what's called a strong learner. So if you think about it, if I pulled the audience today on a topic, in general, the audience would be able to answer whatever question I threw at them with high accuracy. If I asked just one or two people, it would be much lower accuracy. So you can think of the individual more like a weak learner. As a group, you're, you can collectively mine all the information. That's a strong learner. So it's the same kind of concept. Today, we're starting to see more and more ensemble techniques actually being applied to um, neural networks as well. It typically has been applied to things like decision trees. So if you hear of boosted and bagged decision trees, that's really ensemble methods being used on decision trees. So both of those are using you know, many, many different decision trees to kind of group and, and, and get a, a, a better predictive output. Now, under regression, you don't have quite as many algorithms, um, but you see that it's been narrowed down to a few, few more. Um, so many of these you probably have known and may have used. Neural networks might be more newer for some of you, or maybe many of you might be experts in that. I'm not, I'm not sure of all of your background. But this slide just kind of summarizes all those techniques and then actually adds in a, another layer into that reinforcement learning on the right, which is really about prediction. Um, and then there's also, you know, under the unsupervised learning, there's really an area also about dimensionality reduction. A lot of that can be feature, feature um, engineering and being able to re reduce that. I didn't mention that in the previous slides, but recognize that that's there. Now, over on the right, you can see a variety of different algorithms that are usually applied under reinforcement learning. Um, I think towards the middle part of the presentation, I'll kind of differentiate traditional re reinforcement learning versus deep reinforcement learning as an example. But for now, just recognize the different landscape. Many of these things you might have used, some might be new. But one thing I'd like to call out is that if, if you look at the deep learning section towards the bottom, um, it spans pretty much the whole area. It can actually even be used in dimensionality reduction too, but you don't see it applied there quite as much. But that's one of the things why deep neural networks is so um, so pervasive today and studied so so widely is because it's it, it's very adaptable into the variety of different types of problems that you can throw it at. And many of that just comes down to the structure of the architecture of the deep neural network that you can use today. So just to kind of give you a feel between machine learning and deep learning and differentiate the two, um, when we look at the, the traditional process of machine learning, that's really using data and a model to perform a task, right? So keep the concept data separate from model and then the task that they want. To kind of bring this home, here's an example object recognition. When you think of a car, bird, dog, and cat, the whole goal would be to actually build a model that would allow me to classify and label each of these, preferably with some kind of probability. So I have a model. So it could be one of those classification algorithms I talked about earlier. Um, it could even be a shallow neural network as an example. And then let's say, let's take the car. So one of the first things you would do in a traditional machine learning workflow is you take the car. Um, in order to get a prediction that this is a car, knowing that I'm feeding it in a car, you would train the model on that. But before you do that, you often take the, the actual image and actually do feature engineering or feature extraction work on it. Now in the area of image processing, it would be actually doing like line detection or edge detection. So you'd actually detect the shape of the car and feed that into the model and that's what it would use. So you're actually doing a form of, of data reduction that can be then sent to a model. So there's some logic in the way that you do your feature engineering for the model for it to be able to work. And that process is really the pipeline of the machine learning. And that's kind of the practice today when you look, use decision trees as well. But this would then go through, you could feed it the car and it would be able to pr predict it with some level of accuracy. Now, if we contrast that to kind of the, the, the state of the art with deep learning, the advantage is that deep learning allows you to kind of abstract the data part and the model part and actually merge and munge them together. So machine, the, the deep learning today is kind of really letting the machine learn the feature engineering process coupled with the modeling process and then give you a good predictive output. So it's really trying to learn directly from the raw data set, if you think of it that way. So again, using the same concept, we'll run the same kind of approach through it. But what you end up getting with a deep neural network is you have many different layers. And if you looked into like the different layers, this is what you might see come out of it. So it's very hard to kind of interpret what a deep neural network is doing or even understand what it's doing. But as it goes through the different layers, it's extracting the features and making a determination that, oh yes, this is a car. And I, I can assign a 94% probability that that's what it is. So again, when you think about it, comparing the old versus the new, what deep learning is really kind of the advantage of it is that when you build these architectures, you can you can do feature engineering alongside the modeling. 
Um, the good side is that you can get much, much higher accuracy because you're taking advantage of the nonlinearities and maybe some of the data that was lost during the feature engineering step in the prior for traditional machine learning. But the downside is you, you lose some of the ability to interpret or explain what the model's doing. So that's been a challenge, particularly in a risk management perspective um, in finance, is being able to justify using deep neural networks um, because they're kind of opaque boxes. You can look into them, but they're hard to understand. And they're even harder to explain to somebody who doesn't know the technology. So now if we look at reinforcement learning, it's actually different. I think in finance, it's probably one of the, the technologies that has, has some of the best um, opportunity for improvement in, in the financial services industry. And the difference between reinforcement learning compared to um, deep learning is deep learning learned from data, right? Reinforcement learning is really learning to play a game, if you really think about it that way. So what it is, is it's not learning directly from the data, but basically you provide it some guidelines or a policy. So this is the things that you must adhere to. The reinforcement learning algorithm then gets rewards um, based upon the action that it would, stay, would, would take. So if you think about it, the algorithm itself has a policy. If you think about it as a trading policy, what you might implement would be the policy would be to maximize profit while minimizing return, as an example. And then it would be allowed to make trades in a simulated environment. So it would make its first trade in the environment. It would either get a profit or a loss, and then it would learn from that. So the reinforcement learning algorithm continues to adapt and evolve as it learns more about the environment. Now, that's a great advantage of reinforcement learning is that you can actually train these on sparser data sets, or you can actually use simulation tools to train these to become quite good traders, um, as an example. The, and the, 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 the other kind of caveat, though, and this will show up later, is that you know reinforcement learning models are continuously adapting. So if you think of the deep learning model, once you've trained it, you typically use it, and the parameters of the model don't change. But reinforcement learning algorithms continuously adapt. So the parameters are much more dynamic, and it'll learn as, as it learns more about the environment. Now, that's the traditional reinforcement learning um, kind of approach where you'd separate out the policy from the re reinforcement learning um, and the environment. When you actually think about the deep reinforcement learning, again, you're kind of building a, a deep architecture that couples both the policy, the reinforcement learning algorithms all together. So again, it becomes um, much more of a black box system, but the benefit is that it's it's much more able to handle complex or nonlinear systems, continuous or even discrete. So that's 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 kind of the value of going to the deep architecture for reinforcement learning. So now let's talk about some of the challenges with 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 um, validating AI models. I mean, I put models here kind of in, in curly brackets to denote that when you think of a model, you usually think of something simple, easy to explain, maybe an equation. If you can, you can look to the left here, this is some of the challenges with, with modern deep learning architectures is that there are many, many different steps to them. There's an entire network of data flow through that. In this example, it's using an image to classify boats versus water versus land, and then produce that on the output. And you can see how many different steps or procedures there are to go through this. So that's the challenge of, of AI model validation is understanding why the, the network is doing what it is doing. But there are also additional challenges to think about too in the common marketplace. So when you look at today's environment, you know, um, financial services is one of the leading industries in terms of AI adoption. It's also growing the most in terms of its planned spending for AI applications in a variety of other areas as well. You can see the, the report on the, the left from McKinsey. On the right is another one from Gartner that you know polled a lot of senior managers throughout a variety of different industries. And what you can see is that there's definitely um, a budget for a lot more AI projects within the organization. Everybody knows they need to do something with AI. Now the challenge is to figure out how they can use it to best impact their business. But as you can see by 2022, which would be in two years from now, we'd expect a 10x increase of the projects that were just last year. Now, even with COVID-19, this might actually increase some because there is a much more um, faster transition to digital, faster transition to automation, and many more organizations that are adopting AI faster than they ever had, primarily because of um, the push from COVID. And this makes risk management's role even more important than ever. On the left is just some kind of the, uh, as a report that kind of highlights some of the key findings for risk management in terms of finance, the move to digital, um, there's gonna be increased regulatory scrutiny, more complex models, and a, a need to get things done faster and quicker. Over on the right here is kind of a view of the way different AI algorithms are deployed throughout um, a retail banking value chain. You can see that it's showing up everywhere. 
Now, this actually can be more of a challenge for risk, a modern risk manager because they may have just been involved with the trading book or the banking book or investment decisions, but now it's being shown in marketing and does that adhere to our, our privacy and, and um, global GDPR data requirements. So, so risk managers are actually having to become more and more important in terms of looking at the models that are used throughout the organization um, in a variety of different ways they never had to before. And the reality is that you're going to get more models. I mentioned kind of the difference between simple models that are easy to interpret and the ones that are higher, higher, higher accuracy but harder to interpret. So we're going to have more of those. There's going to be more complex models and maybe even systems of models coupled together. The other thing is with AI, there's a lot of IT innovation being driven. So you're getting IT innovating with um, development and then traditional quants and mathematicians to develop new AI technologies. And those are actually getting integrated into the DevOps process. So now you have coupled processes where all of this comes across. And that's one of the challenges is do we know everywhere AI is being used throughout our different products that we're creating. And then of course, there'll be continued to be disruption. COVID-19 recently, there's a whole movement around environmental, social, and governmental based investments or risk management policies. And climate change is now a big um, hot topic as well. So these things are all disrupting how the businesses are going about their business. Just um, just within the last year, the Mathrix is committed to become carbon neutral within the next five years, as an example. That's something, you know, five years ago, I don't think I would have thought this company would have been thinking about. But that's an example of how things are now driving different business decisions um, throughout there. But the reality is I've been talking to many of our customers, and many of them still have inconsistent um, environments today that are not easy to scale and move towards the modern digital environment ready for an AI enabled organization. This is just an example from one of our customers. You know, they have a lot of different data sources, they're inconsistent run times, this leads to poor quality models, and then you know a lot of high cost and frustrated users. So we at the Mathrix, one of the things we try and do is really build tools that can plug into current environments and make it easy to move towards a more innovative pipeline. And then I also like this one because this just reminds me of how fun it is to, to work with Python and, and modern um, software is that you know, there's so many dependencies, and especially when you think about it from a validation standpoint and how all those dependencies need to be validated as part of that process, it can be a real big change. But I like this one because it really talks about how um, you know, I have so many different installs of Conda in different environments that you can actually look at my laptop as a super fun site. There's so many different wastes projects that are out there with different environments that it's hard to keep track of. So we look at you know, the criteria for trusted AI algorithms, and particularly for validation. Um, that's what we're gonna talk about in this next section. And there's really these kind of these six pillars. I mentioned safety earlier is important to the Mathworks. Um, this is an important area to make sure that your AI algorithms are deployed into, into systems that are safe, secure, and are not making bad decisions for the firm. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more a little bit later about explainability and interpretability. These are two different concepts, but people often use them interchangeably. I wanna kind of tease those two apart. And the first one is explainability is can you actually describe what the AI system is doing in human terms? So if you had to go to your board, would you be able to explain the model? to them and how it's working and have them feel comfortable that you're using it. The other one is interpretable. Do you actually understand how the AI model is performing and trace the data to decision within that environment? Some of the other things now is more important is um, fairness of the models. Uh, recently, Apple's with their new credit card got in hot water because it was a bias toward, towards males, as an example. Amazon's HR automation system was actually biasing it towards different um, types of candidates. So those are things that we now have to be aware of when we deploy these things into new different, new and different applications we may not have thought of before, is that the data sets that we use might inherently have bias in them and we've got to protect against that bias um, showing up. And that also leads to trusted. So is your, is your algorithms immune to hacks, common attacks, and does it provide data protection and privacy, you know? from those environments. And then also is the, is the AI algorithms robust? You wanna make sure that you're deploying them into an operation environment that can, can handle anything that's thrown at and not fail and not fail in a spectac spectacular way. So to, to peel back the onion a little bit on explainability versus interpretability, here's, here's two examples. So on the left, I'm looking at an image of a dog. Might be kind of hard to make out in here, but you can see the, the heat map on top, which is kind of really highlighting the features that were important for the decision of why it, it classified this picture as a schnauzer, a type of dog that actually has mustaches and, and eyebrows. And that's where the heat map is. So this is a, an example of explainability and explainability tools. I can look at the map, overlay the feature importance and say, oh, it's, it's choosing a schnauzer because of these characteristics. So I'm explaining it, but in this example, I don't look at anything to do with the architecture that was used behind this neural network as an example. Over on the right is a tree where you can actually go through and trace the decision for the temperature modeling 
example shown here and why it's doing that and which were the features were important and why the decision came that way. So that's the difference between explainability and interpretability. The other thing is when you're talking about robustness, um, you know, it can be a challenge to make sure that your systems are robust. And, way, and ways you can do that is start using adversarial techniques that they're using today, which is just basically taking images, doing rotations, throwing in white noise, doing a lot of adversarial challenges to the system and see what happens. In this example, there's a, a street sign that was trying to be rec um, recognized with a stop sign. On the left, it was classified as a street sign properly. You simply rotate that image, run it back through the classification system, and it called it a laptop. Largely, I think, because of the, the angle the street signs make at that particular perspective. But that's kind of the danger with some of the, the machine learning algorithms is they have a limited classification vocabulary, and they're always going to predict something. So that's one of the things is it may predict something that's nonsensical. And if that's used in a, in a different environment, that could have consequences. So this is a way to understand the robustness and of the predictions of your algorithms. The other thing to take in mind is that there's a lot, a lot of guidance starting to come out of regulatory bodies in finance. Here's one from the Singapore, Monet, Singapore Monetary Authority. This specifically talking about machine learning and some of the things you need to, to, to take into consideration, such as is the attributes that are being put in there justified or, or can you justify use of personal attributes? Um, when we talk about like Apple's credit card, for example, it used personal characteristics that then gave biased decision. So if you are going to use those attributes, you need to be able to justify them in the models today and why they're you're used and you're not being biased in any way. The other thing is that the decisions need to be regularly reviewed. When you think about it, the data sets, the environment is always changing. So making sure that these these models are being used in a way that they're actually being reviewed for their fit, and, fit form and purpose is important. That can also be important when you often do periodic retraining of these models. Um, that's often a dynamic modeling capability that comes into play. And then the other one is, is, is these models are making business decisions and who's held accountable for that. If you think of the automated driving area, if a car actually you know, violates a, a safety law or actually kills somebody, who's held accountable? The car manufacturer, the manufacturer of the AI system, or the person that's sitting there in the car, but maybe not, not um, that's using it. So those are kinds of the things you need to think about with your algorithms as well. And then there's also, you know, in order to use these, you still have to go through a model validation process and explain the decisions of what these are making and why the data is used in the way that it is. So that leads to kind of how would you modify a model risk management framework to take into effect the new kind of innovations from machine learning? And this is a study from McKinsey that just kind of highlights the different areas that you could you could you don't have to change in gray, some of the areas that you modify um, in the the blue, and then some of the new areas. And I'm just going to highlight the middle one, the output, which is really inter interpretability and bias. Those are definitely new in the outputs that you'd have to do and make sure that you you account for those didn't have to be put in before because inherently those characteristics were done when we did the feature engineering process up, upstream. And then the other one is in the ongoing monitoring, there's a dynamic model calibration. Um, that's important because often these, these machine learning models are retrained um, on new data periodically. So here, I just wanna highlight that in, in order to integrate those, there are a variety of new techniques that are evolving and coming out of research. Um, a couple here is like the explainable neural networks. I'm going to dive a little bit into that in the next section. And then there are also different global or local that are, um, performance scoring that you can use that are model agnostic. So they're not dependent upon the model, such as Lyme and Shapley values as an example. So these are new types of, of criteria you can use to evaluate models. If you're used to traditional statistical models, when you think of statistical tests, the t-test, confidence intervals, Lyman and Shapley are really looking at kind of which features are more important and giving a weighted measure to that. So under the explainable neural network, uh, the DARPA is actually spending a lot of um, research dollars trying to do this. And what they're really looking at is building explainable models and then also an explainable human interpretable interface on top of that. Now, I mentioned that you could you could create, you know, that, that algorithm I first used with describing a dog or a cat. So the other part with the exp explanation interface might be another model that actually interrogates the the machine learning model understands which features were important and then reports that back to the user. So for example, that heat map really kind of highlighted the, the eyebrows and the, the, must, the, the bushy mustache of the, the schnauzer. Well, that could actually be put into a natural language kind of explanation. It says a dog was chosen with 94% accuracy to be a schnauzer because of its hairy eyebrows and hairy face. You know? So those are the ways we're trying to make these, these black boxes more explainable to people. 
Now, the other part in terms of interpretation is being able to look layer by layer and understand what's going on. In this example, I have input data clustered. Um, this happens to be a variety of different food sources. And on the right is the actual outcome. Um, and then there's an image that's going layer by layer through the deep neural network. And you can see how as it's going through the layers, how the, the different layers are picking up on different characteristics of the data and starting to bucket things into their natural kind of clusters or classifications. So this is one way of really diving in and interpreting um, the network is visual inspection. Another one is you can actually look at how it's training over time. And I'm going to use a, an example of a Siamese network, which is really training two networks on the same data set. And really what we're comparing at the end is a distance measure, but not the raw output from the neural network. So this gives a little bit better um, training in particular when you have, a, uh, have um, less data to train with, but also it's useful in kind of both verification and validation. So for example, um, if you have a handwriting check that has your signature on it and the top one, it says, yes, it's Stuart's signature. The bottom one would then say, it would compare to it and it would also verify this Stuart's signature. It says, yeah, I have another approach, but it seems to be doing the same thing. So we agree that this is both Stuart's signature. Same thing with face detection. Siamese networks are actually becoming more and more used for kind of fraud detection type of applications as well. The other one is that the, the gener generative adversarial networks, or GANs, is actually very popular in finance to generate scenarios, environmental scenarios. And what this is, is you're really using two neural networks wired together. One is, is a discriminator network, which is looking at the comparison of, of a, a fake set of image generated out of the generator compared to the training set and saying, yes, it's real or fake. And I'm just going to show a quick simulation. This is you start with the white noise matrix, but over time, the generator is actually going to learn how to build or be trained to build fake synthetic data that then passes the discriminator. So as an example, it very quickly starts to learn to build fake faces. So all of these faces are not real people. They're built um, from different characteristics of people from the training set. But as you can see, by the time it goes through a short iteration interval here, that you know many of these faces are really starting to be recognizable as a face, um, even though that these are synthetically generated people. And this is kind of the technology behind a lot of that deep fakes that you hear in the industry today. So to wrap this up, I'm going to really go through kind of the machine learning and a model risk management framework. And really, as many organizations have a, a model risk management framework, when we break it out into kind of different environments, the development environment, the model risk um, review environment for the validation team, kind of the model test and validation. So when you want to migrate these models into production settings, the actual production environment, and then monitoring that. But kind of the key thing that we've built our solution on top of is the concept of the model inventory and repository, where it combines all of the feedback from all of those different um, life cycles to, to, to monitor, track, and create a lineage and auditing trail of what's going on within the model. Now, just to give you some examples of how machine learning is integrated into this, you can see a library of pre-trained models over on the left that you can start from. Um, other things is you can integrate from, you can pull in libraries from like TensorFlow, Keras, and a variety of other areas, build from um, an existing library, and then dive in and tweak and, 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 and optimize it using visual tools such as the Deep Network Designer. The other thing we built is a variety of build templates. So you can quickly build like a credit scorecard example um, within the tools. So this allows you to kind of automate the process that you go through to validate models. And a little bit later, I'll show you how all of these are integrated into automated documentation capabilities. We can see you can go through, build it, um, have scorecards, interactive apps that allow you to do this. The same technology can then be used by model validators to go through and interrogate the, the models and play with different data sets as inputs and outputs and understand the model. And then you can also like bring in challenger models, the machine learning algorithms and challenger models. So this is an example of using the classification learner app that'll actually go through, bring in a data set, and then we'll go ahead and train on multiple different models. And you can see it's training on a couple different trees very quickly. So now you can build and test models in parallel and build a bunch of challenger models and understand which ones are doing the best and integrate that in there. Now, the other thing is that everything you do within the MATLAB environment, you can do interactive live documentation. Here's some examples where you can actually add controls, um, make it easier for model review. And then of course, all of this is documentation is tied to the ability to generate custom templated documents for your organization, <coughs> excuse me. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna fast forward a bit and show you the part where it's actually tied to your original model. So you can see the refresh button added here is it'll actually go back through, recalibrate, rerun the models, and then dump the stuff back into the automated documentation report. <coughs> Excuse me. And what that really allows you to do is, is, is drive the development and validation process of models much more quickly. You have to spend less time documenting and more time innovating.
So with that, I'm going to wrap up. Um, just kind of mention the different tools that we have here, from across the the, the you know data import to the actual real time deployment into applications. It's actually interoperable from a variety of different platforms. You can think of the first step as bringing in your model, developing them within the MATLAB environment, deploying it out to the model inventory, review, reporting capabilities, integrating with a variety of other technologies such as Spark and Hadoop, putting that into some kind of continuous build and test system, scaling it with parallel computing and production server, and then even deploying that to different different backends. So we provide a flexible framework that integrates with the environment um, of, of choice that you may have. So with that, I know I kind of ran a little long. I may not have left a lot of time for, for Shri, but um, I'll just leave this up here and he can he can jump into his section. And I'll maybe we'll have some time at the end to answer questions. Cool, thank you so much. What uh, Stu was mentioning, um, one of the key things we have been looking at uh, is how do you think about validating the entire workflow? Because when you think about a machine learning experiment, it's no longer just gonna be the model. Right? So you have to, first of all, put together an entire workflow about this is where the data comes in. This is where you're going to be staging it. You're going to be pre-processing it. You're going to be augmenting it with additional features or additional data sets. And then you're going to be thinking about uh, building your multiple models. And then you'll be potentially testing it out and deploying it. So uh, when you think about the entire workflow, there is no way you could just basically run everything on one laptop. Right? Because in an enterprise setting, you're going to be working with multiple folks. You're going to be trying out different configurations, different tools, different databases, different storages. Uh, it could be running on the cloud. It could be uh, designed in uh, you know, some environments. But you may also be thinking about either sourcing various APIs, or you're going to be taking existing pre-trained models, and you're going to be augmenting it or transfer learning and doing multiple things with it. So I'm gonna give you a workflow on how we typically think about this whole notion of what is called as algorithmic auditing. Because ultimately it's about not only getting the model right, but getting the entire process in the pipeline right. Otherwise you're just gonna be having a fantastically built model, but all the other pieces which are supposed to be feeding into this model may not have been validated well, which leads to a lot of process risk, model risk, governance challenges, and ultimately the failure of getting your model into deployment. So what I'm gonna do is just basically give you like a big picture orientation on uh, you know, how we have kind of looked at it and I'm gonna give you a demo. Um, so uh, the first thing I wanna tell you is, you know, the machine learning workflow as we have all known has evolved significantly over the last decade. Because initially it was always model centric, but now you're realizing that depending on the kind of data you have, depending on the kind of problem you're gonna be having, you're gonna be designing different kinds of workflows. And that's basically what we have been you know, discussing as a part of the machine learning summer school. Over the last eight weeks, you know, our, our participants have been going through the various stages, we're understanding the challenges and how do you think about building out various aspects of the, uh, the puzzle as you build out the various models? And from a, from a model risk management perspective, we have had participants kind of go through the whole workflow and understand that it's no longer just thinking about model validation. It's about thinking about the validation of the entire pipeline or the process validation. So this is an interesting paper, the hidden technical depth in machine learning systems, which kind of reinforces that whole notion about, you know, you have to think not only in the context of uh, uh, building out the model, but you have to think about the entire pipeline. So um, as uh, Stu was alluding to, you know, there are so many frameworks, Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch on the deep learning uh, spectrum, but also modeling toys, uh, choices. You have so many tools you can potentially work with. Um, so uh, there are a bunch of different open source tools. The one is called as MLflow, uh, which helps you manage some of the models, another one, uh, called DVC, which helps you do lineage and provenance of various data sets and models, uh, and a lot of uh, obviously proprietary and commercial tools too. So we just wanted to illustrate a case study on how we would take you know, various components of the pipeline and then build out a process for validation. And we you do that all the time when we do algorithmic auditing for 
various clients. So the use case I'm going to illustrate is uh, a sentiment analysis engine for uh, for uh, using NLP techniques. And uh, we're going to start with earning call transcripts, which you can download from uh, either uh, you know Seeking Alpha or you can go directly to the Edgar website and you can download them. And then obviously, if you are trying to you know, uh, think about sentiment analysis, you need to have label data and uh, the financial data sets are kind of the driest data sets out there, right? You don't get a lot of emotions. It's not the IMDB data set. So where you can understand emotions and label them easily. So what we're gonna do is use various APIs like the Google API or the Comprehend API or the, uh, the IBM's API for primarily doing the labeling and then build out a trained data set. Now, if, if we were to do it in an enterprise setting, you could use a combination of uh, you know, either APIs or you could have experts going and label saying if there's a particular statement, whether it's a positive statement or a negative statement kind of a thing. So this is kind of the pipeline, um, you know, just to illustrate and combine various components. Uh, we have a couple of components which rely and has been built in Python. Uh, we are invoking APIs, the Amazon API, Google API, the IBM Watson API, Azure APIs. So they're basically using uh, machine learning as a service. So you pass in the JSON and then you get back uh, information. Um, and then what we are doing is we are comparing the various APIs, taking those data sets, and then we are passing it into MATLAB and we're gonna do sentiment analysis in MATLAB. Uh, we also built an extension to this wherein you could take that, maybe get a, a pre-trained model, a BERT model maybe, and then use transfer learning and then build a fine-tuned model for our purposes. So that's kind of the, uh, the thing. And then the platform you're using is what's called as the Q Sandbox. Uh, for people who have been using the Q Academy, Q Academy actually uses Q Sandbox behind the scenes. So uh, Q uh, Sandbox is basically a bigger platform which helps you do rapid prototyping, auditing, reporting, tracking, and various aspects. But the enterprise segment and the, all the stuff we do is on the, the sandbox. But the Q Academy is basically using the same infrastructure for building out labs and sharing it. So when I show you the, the various features, you'll kind of understand like the, the various components of the puzzle. Um, so various aspects, you know, we're gonna you know, standardize and build out the pipelines, rapid prototype it on the sandbox, build out trackable experiments and then functionize it. So I'm gonna show you a couple of components as we encapsulate the various things and build it out. Uh, so we support you know, both enterprise and um, open source packages. So as I mentioned before, we built an integration with MATLAB recently. So I'll illustrate how that actually works, but there is no real platform restriction. You can use open source or enterprise products depending on the workflows you have at hand. Uh, and then we have a tool called as the model management studio, which helps you articulate what you intend to do as a part of your workflow. That way you can basically focus on the four components. One is your data component, your environment component, your uh, process component, and the, the various aspects of the, of, the, of the pipeline. So let me kind of you know, get to the demo. I know we are running a little bit late. Um, so this is basically a view of the, the model studio. And as you can see, we have built in a six stage pipeline. And uh, as you can see in the pipeline, in the first stage, we're gonna go into uh, the Edgar database and scrape the data. We're gonna do some pre-processing in here. And then we're gonna build out a sentiment analysis model in here. And here we are gonna call out four different APIs and get back the label data set and then invoke MATLAB so that a MATLAB developer, for example, let's say if they're, you know, a MATLAB developer is building out a sentiment analysis model, obviously they're not gonna go start from scraping the data in, in a large enterprise. Probably, you know, you have data engineers who have already built out a pipeline wherein they scrape the data, pre-processes, massage it, and have it readily available in a database, which they're gonna be, the modelers are gonna be using for building out the models. So that's kind of what the modelers are gonna focus on in this particular stage. And then we also built a reference application wherein you could take BERT or other models and build out uh, 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 basically a prototype for trying out different kinds of models and the effect they would have. So that's kind of uh, what you're seeing in here. And um, when you run these pipelines, you know basically things you need to understand is first of all, you need to be able to track each one of these stages on what's actually happening. So when you look at each one of these stages, so you can kind of see whether you know they're running or they're been killed. 
so some of these are like you know in process pipelines so you can kind of you know see uh, with the various stages at which uh, you know the, the the pipeline is currently running some of them would be completed so you know if you look at the completed so this is like you know the various uh, pipeline runs i have had so this one is currently running for the demo purposes i'm kind of you know illustrating what's uh, currently running so each one of these six stages are running and uh, so you can connect to each one of these uh, things and so this was as i mentioned was the scraper uh, so you can go in and you can look at like you know what the scraper had done uh, as a part of our uh, you know initial uh, exercise so we basically wanted to you know try out some sample files so you can go into the actual python code or the, the matlab code or whatever you prefer to use and then you would be able to see the raw text you can see the log files and you can see various components as a part of the puzzle um, and each one of these stages has the various components. So what we have done is we are registering all these components as part of ML uh, flow. So as you can see, each one of these stages, um, so this was the recent run. So you can run multiple things. You can like capture various parameters associated with it. And then here you can see the various aspects and the artifacts will tell you, you know, this was like the scrape data as it finished the scraping of the data, this is what you're gonna see. So that was like the first stage and then, um, uh, the second stage was pre-processing. The third stage was kind of building out the sentiment analysis. The fourth stage was various APIs and building out the various API comparison. Um, so just to illustrate, you know, if I go into like the, the fourth stage and look at the various components. So this is where I've hit the Azure API, the Comprehend API and the Google API. And these are the associated CSV files uh, for all the data. Now, we are going to be building a bunch of different models and you can also do model management, right? So here we have looked at some TensorFlow models and looking at each one of them, we are trying to you know, build out um, you know, transfer learning uh, starting from a BERT model. Now the data sets themselves, so we can like pass that on to MATLAB. So you can see that you know, once all the four stages were completed, we passed it on to MATLAB. So you can just click that button um, and then what that's going to do is you gotta get into MATLAB. So for the MATLAB developer, they need not know like you know what has happened before, because what we have done is we have basically connected that on you know everything is running on Amazon, so it gets staged onto a data source, and once it gets to the data source, all the MATLAB developers who are supposed to be accessing this will actually share that and the various snapshots in their shared folder. So this was like the snapshot we currently ran. So as you can see that these were the three files which ran on, you know, this today is the 26th August. Um, so this is, I think, a uh, different time zone, obviously. Uh, so you have the associated files and now you have the various components of the CSV file. So the data is readily, freshly published for the user. And then uh, they'll be able to like, you know, run the associated, uh, you know, scripts and they will be able to like, uh, see the, uh, you know, run the sentiment analysis and look at the prediction accuracy and see the associated graphs. Uh, from a MATLAB developer's perspective, as you can notice, we haven't done any install of MATLAB. Everything's running on the browser. So this is the MATLAB online server. It's integrated into the MATLAB online server. So when they go in, they just need a working browser and they go in, they try out the code and you can also snapshot the code. So all the code you have been building is also gonna be published as a part of your model validation process. That way uh, you're not kind of, you know, transferring code back and forth to your laptops, everything's running. And it works really well in a remote learning or a remote working setup in today's day and age when people are working with their own laptops and infrastructure at homes. And now you are figuring out like what components of stuff which is coming from somebody's personal laptop has to be integrated in a production setting in an enterprise, especially in a financial industry setting with all the security and uh, other aspects. So here, for example, so all the data is currently on the cloud infrastructure, it's fully managed and it's completely tracked and you're kind of observing all the components as a part of uh, your uh, various workflow. So the last component of the puzzle. So once we are able to like run this, so we wanted to try out like, what if we had like, you know, run various aspects and run various experiments. So you can see now that we have run multiple experiments in here, some of them error out, some of them, you know, you can kind of see the various versions. So this is like the latest version. So we started out with uh, these data sets. So we have like BERT and the associated uh, models in here. 
and uh, you know in the in the model studio so we completed this uh, whole exercise so we wanted to see like how would it look and we have built out like a reference application so in this reference application so you basically take the data and you kind of you know analyze the various apis so here's like azure the comprehend the google and the bert model is we took the bert model as is from the tensorflow model hub and then we you know transfer learn but by using the data we had just scraped and uh, was labeled with various data sets. So uh, we can kind of you know, compare and contrast different results. Like if you look at the, each one of them from a sentiment analysis perspective, what was positive, what was neutral, and what was negative, and then what was like the most positive one in uh, Azure, Comprehend, uh, Google API, and BERT. So you can kind of you know, look at for each one of these statements what it would be. Um, so this would be uh, from a validation perspective, trying to understand whether specific APIs do a good job or not from your business use case, but also comparing and contrasting different APIs and also models. So you could potentially think about, you know, building something from scratch, you know, using MATLAB or Python or whatever it is, or you could potentially use an API. And then based on the use case, you may want to audit, you know, what actually works for your case, uh, whether, you know, then you are kind of you know, deploying it into your workflow. And once you have the, the whole process, you know, some of it, you know, we have already documented it, so you can kind of, you know, see. Uh, so this one becomes good for model validators. You know, you're kind of understanding the entire workflow, what has actually happened, you know, when you kind of, you know, look at different kinds of models, when you do comparison of various sorts. And now everything is kind of in a managed workflow, wherein you are, you know, capturing the provenance of the data, the models, and the pipelines. And you have a very well structured workflow, which is ready for either internal audit or for external audit. And now you can think about quantification of the risk on which components add risk to your particular pipeline. And then uh, you can focus on you know, alleviating or mitigating or removing those, um, uh, controlling those aspects of the risk. But also from an external auditor perspective, so when we come in as a third party model validator, so when we look at a process, we kind of you know, try to structure it in such a way so that every component uh, is clearly defined and you have the demarcation of what goes from one segment to another. That way you can potentially kind of not only build out the entire workflow, but also know that this is what's going into production. And from a, you know, a model perspective, which versions of the models are going into production and how are we tracking the associated aspects of uh, the runs on each one of these from a, from a tracking and logging perspective. So I just wanted to kind of give you a demo to tie in the concepts which Stu was talking about and just to kind of make it real on how various components could potentially be operationalized uh, in an enterprise setting. So how about we go for like one or two questions and then uh, you know, we, can, we can adjourn for the day. So are you seeing agent-based modeling as an upcoming method under machine learning? Um, well, I think you have to define agent. I mean, there's a variety of different ways of thinking about agent-based modeling. Um, reinforcement learning is often using the concept of an agent, and that's the one that's being, right. I think, the most pursued from research perspective because it couples, you know, machine learning and deep learning together with learning um, as an agent. There are there are different ways of of approaching agent-based modeling, which have been around in finance for years. Um, but I think it, it all depends upon the different areas. I haven't, I've seen it mostly with related to reinforcement learning though, but there are, oh. I think you do, you do hear about it more in the econometric space where they're trying to think about the different agents of the economy and how they interact with each other. And you know, a lot of the, a lot of the older, you know, you think of DSG dyna, dynamic mm -hmm. stochastic general equilibrium models right. are moving more towards agent based frameworks, not necessarily reinforcement agents, but just agent based frameworks. And that's where you do see it popping up. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, uh, I think that there was also an outcasting demo, which kind of you know used some of the agent-based yeah. modeling concepts using DSG and other, other methodologies. Uh, another question is, how do you validate models when the model is continuously learning? Uh, for example, if you're using time series data sets. Well, I mean, if it's continuously learning, you 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 go about validating the process behind it. So in that case, that becomes a continuous validation process in many ways. But really, before you release it out to learn in a live setting, you have to validate that the process is sound. You still have to adhere to SR 11.7 guidance, make sure that you know its form, fit, and function is useful. And then with these dynamic or always updating, it's not necessarily about validating the coefficients or the parameters of the model, but its decision process and then the, the um, 
the constant updating requires more model monitoring and the decision whether you need to revalidate it or look at the data that it's using um, more frequently. So it's, it's a lot more about the process around it. It has to be beefed up than it has in the past. Um, but you still have to validate that the concept is sound. You can explain what it's doing and why that there are safety provisions in place in case it goes haywire. Absolutely. And I think you've also answered a bunch of questions already and we're running a little bit late. So yeah. I think uh, we should kind of adjourn for the day. And Stu, thank you. This was a very informative session. And uh, uh, I don't think you had even seen the whole workflow with MATLAB demo. So you probably saw it for the first time on our end. Yeah, uh, it's cool to see. It's really cool to see. Oh, thank you. Um, so if anybody is interested in uh, you know, taking a look at the demo or getting to know about the workflow which we just presented, uh, please do reach out to us. We actually have a trial of MATLAB which is currently running. So you will be able to experience the whole flow and also uh, use MATLAB in an online setting. So you can try out the MATLAB online server through the Q sandbox. Uh, we have the trial going on for a little bit. So please do reach out to us. And I'll also be sending some information that way you can reach out to me um, and uh, we can kind of you know try it out. Um, and uh, please remember to tune in again on September 2nd for the next session wherein we are gonna elaborate further on explainability uh, in AI. And we'll also talk about bias. And we have, uh, uh, we're kind of uh, mixing some of these sessions. So we have been looking at, you know, educators, academics, industry practitioners, and now, uh, you know, uh, Stu is presenting from a platform developer's perspective, like, you know, how they're building out the tooling in the industry. And in the next segment, we're going to talk about how are startups and inverse investors looking at this whole space. And there is a lot of pockets of innovation happening in the AI explainability space and various startups are innovating in various ways. So we're going to have an experienced entrepreneur who is at Zest.ai, who's going to be talking from a uh, from, a, uh, pers from the perspective of an entrepreneur, but then Jennifer Jordan, who has been tracking the whole industry from an investor's perspective, who's also at Techstars. So she's going to be talking about, and we have a couple of uh, people representing some portfolio companies of hers, uh, kind of talking about the whole notion of AI and explainability. So it's going to be a good session. Um, so we'll see you back again on uh, September 2nd at 12 o'clock sharp to continue the discussion. Thanks again, Stu, and uh, thank you for MathWorks for making this session happen. Hey, you're welcome. It was Thank a you. pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.